Okay, we're picking up, hopefully I'm right here, Cano 29, a Purgatorio. Um, we're not going to get through the first 11 cantos, we haven't yet in any day, of um, Paradiso, but I'm hoping we'll get through at least the first four, maybe more than that, five, six. So where we left off, <coughs> Dante still had not crossed the river Lethe. So, he's in paradise almost. The earthly paradise. All right? And it begins, Canto 29 begins, singing, singing as might some dona deep and low. She then went on and brought an end to words, Beati quorum tecta sunt peccata. Blessed are those whose sins are taken away, Psalm 32, okay? This is Matilda. She's only named once, and we don't really know where Dante got the name from. If you read the notes, um, look at other editions, kind of an enigma. Um, there's one, let's see, I had it in my notes somewhere, and I don't have it anymore. Um, there is a Matilda in European history, at Dante time and just before, but scholars aren't sure if that's who Dante is referring to or not. Okay, so Dante keeps traversing one side of this river, and she's on the other side. All right. Now there's another Middle English, there's another medieval word, Middle English poem, great Middle English poem called the Pearl. Okay, which is in the same manuscript as Sir Down and the Green Knight. And in that poem, you have a dreamer, kind of like Dante, who wakes up, uh, or excuse me, who has this vision, this dream. And in this dream, he's in a garden, kind of like Dante. He's on one side of a river, and this young girl is on the other side of the river. The young girl is the soul of his daughter. Okay, So this motif isn't, um, isn't necessarily unique to Dante. Right. More than likely, the Pearl Poet um, might not have known, known Dante in the original, but probably had heard of at least of Dante's Divine Comedy and of this imagery. So, line 15, she speaks to him and says, Dear brother, watch now and listen. Okay. So just watch. And listen to what is said. And look, a sudden radiance darting all around pierced that great forest through and through, in which I thought that lightning may have struck. But lightning, Dante goes on, when it comes, is quenched at once. That is, it flashes and then it's gone. This light, however, stays. This enduring shone out more and more. The implication is not that this is a constant level of light. It's getting brighter and brighter. And so he says, what is this? And then through all that luminous air, there ran a melody so fine that pure zeal made me reprove the recklessness of Eve. In other words, damn it, Eve, we could have had this, this kind of glory, for all eternity. Where earth and heaven displayed obedience, a woman, one alone, formed only now, was not content to stay beneath the veil. Had she in true devotion stayed beneath I should have known these pleasures, past all speech, far sooner, and enjoyed them at more length. If Eve hadn't screwed up, okay, Dante says, then I would have known these pleasures all my life. So, while he's thinking about these, the pleasures yielded by eternity caught up desiring yet more happiness ahead of us. Beneath the branching green, the air blazed up like newly kindled fire, and that sweet sound was clearly heard as song. So, he addresses the muses and then says, line 43, because now he's seeing something more than just light. It's like his eyes are getting accustomed to the brightness, and he's seeing within the light. He's seeing something illumined by the light. Just further on were seven trees of gold, that semblance given them mistakenly by distance that between us intervened, that is, they looked like trees of gold only because of the distance between myself and them. They're not really trees of gold, in other words. These are something else. 
which if you looked back to 594, Kirkpatrick tells us these are probably uh, jumping down, which I am. Uh, bands of light are usually taken to represent the seven gifts of God's Holy Spirit which fall upon human virtue and bring it to perfection. These gifts are wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. Some of these are also going to be referred to later in terms of the seven cardinal virtues. Okay, So, seven trees of gold. And he says, and when I've got so near to them that now these things lost nothing of their proper form, that power that sins as man or rational thought, discern that these were candle-bearing staves. At a distance, they look like trees. Why? Because they've got branches on them. These are seven branched candelabras, or candle sticks. And he hears Hosanna in that singing voice. Filled full of radiant wonder, line 55, I turned round to honest Virgil, and he answered me with looks no less weighed down by heavy awe. So, he turns to Virgil for what? What does he usually, or what has he, up until he reached the top point of purgatory? He gets that final P released. What has he been turning to Virgil continuously for? Information. Explanation. Information. Well, can Virgil explain this? No, he can't. He answered me with looks no less weighed down. He's just in awe. So, Dante says, I restored my gaze to those high things that came towards us now. Notice, this image, whatever this image is, whatever these things are, they're approaching Dante. They're drawing closer to him. He's standing still at this point. The lady reprimanded me. That is, the girl on the other side of the lake. Uh, river. Why burn so moved to see alone these living lights and fail to look at what comes after them? In other words, he's enamored just with the golden lampstands and the light that they show. What's her point? What is every light for? To illumine, to cast light on something, okay? She's saying, why are you focusing on, say for example, the flashlight, rather than what the flashlight is casting light onto. Well, keep in mind, he's, he's just recently, let's say, beginning to have his eyes opened. So he's kind of bedazzled by all of this. I then saw, guided by the flames, now coming, I then saw people, excuse me, got the subject out, uh, people guided by the flames, now coming near to us. Their robes were white of brilliant purity not seen down here, okay? Down here, here on earth. He's juxtaposing what he sees there with what we see down here, okay? The water to my left reflected fire, rendered back to me if I look down as mirrors do the sight of my left side. So, he's like this, the stream's on his left side, they're on the other side. He sees those flames diminishing, move on, leaving behind a paint stroke in the air, as though they all drew penance after them. What's the image? It's of a rainbow. Okay. So that above them there were seven streams, their colors, those the sun makes with its bow, or else the girdle of the Delian moon. The penance stretched far back beyond his sight, that is as far as he can see, and under this fine sky, as here described, were elders. 24 who walked in pairs. So you get, notice, all of these images, and every one of these images is a biblical image. So, for example, uh, you get the 24 elders who walked in pairs, and each of them was crowned with a fleur-de-lis. Okay? 
Okay. Sayers notes in, in her notes, the figures are taken from Revelation 4.4. 4. They represent the books of the Old Testament as grouped by St. Jerome, 12 minor prophets counting as one book, Samuel King's Chronicles as one each, and Ezra and Nehemiah being grouped together as one. They're crowned with the lilies of pure righteousness and their song adapted from the angel salutation of Mary. Okay. Reminds us that the whole of the old dispensation, dispensation is permitted is prophetic of and a preparation for the incarnation because what do they sing line 85 they're all singing you among the daughters born to adam are benedicta your beauty blessed to all eternity blessed art thou among women is what gabriel sings all right and so he keeps looking dante and he sees there came behind them now so the seven Lamp stands first. They're casting light. Okay. He sees behind the lamp stands the four and twenty elders. Okay. Behind the four and twenty elders, or the twenty-four elders, he sees now four animals, and each of these crowned with boughs of green. Each was fledged and feathered with six wings. Each animal has six wings. Okay. Feathers were all peacock eyed, that is, they look like peacock feathers. The eyes of Argus would, if they still live, be like this. And he says, read Ezekiel to get an example of what I'm talking about. Okay? And as you'll find them written on his page, one of, line 103, so were they, except that as to wings, St. John is with me and departs from him. So the space that lay between the four, there's what? A two-wheeled chariot. So the image, I think, is of is you've got the four beasts like this and between them is the chariot being drawn by something okay, the something's attached to what would be the yoke and harness and stuff but here it's shaped like a cross so he goes on the space that lay between these four contain what are the four beasts, by the way? They're the four evangelists. Okay. The medieval illumination, a medieval manuscript. Each of the evangelists is, an, is a beast, or is portrayed by a beast. John is an eagle. Uh, your footnotes explain what each of them appear as. One's an ox, one's a lion, and then there's one other one. The beast that is drawing this cart is a griffon. What's a griffon? And eagle and a lion. Why eagle and lion? Why not a, um, like in Harry Potter, why not like Buckbeak the Hippogriff, which is an eagle and a horse? Why not an eagle and a horse? Why eagle and lion? What are each half, let's say, of, of that beast? What are what is the eagle and what is the lion? Well, the lion is king of beasts, and the eagle is king of the birds of the air. Okay? So they're each kingly. But notice, notice what else they are. The eagle of the air, the lion tied down here to earth. Don't think of air. Think of heaven and earth. What is the griffon? Christ. <clears throat> Why? According to traditional Christian theology, Christ is a single person in two natures. Divine, fully God according to the creed, and fully man. Not mixed, okay, but very God of very God, and born of a virgin. Died, was buried, etc. Okay? So, the griffon held his two wings stretched on high between the middle band and three and three, so that in cleaving air he did no harm. So the griffin, notice, 
is attached here. It's got multiple wings. And the rest of its body is here. It's attached to what? The cross. Okay. Skip it a little bit, go to 121. Beside the right hand wheel, three ladies came. So this wheel over here. Three ladies came, all dancing in a ring, the first so red that she and fire would hardly have been seen. These are the three, um, the three, and then are going to be four more mentioned, okay? So a total of seven. These are the seven cardinal virtues. The first three are the three holy virtues, faith, hope, and love, all right? And then you get courage, wisdom, justice, and temperance as the others. Um, the next is if for very bones and flesh were fashioned from the freshest emerald, the third like snow. So you have red, green, and white. Four ladies to the left. So you've got the three holy virtues over here and the four um, other virtues on this side. Purple clothed. Why? Purple? Royalty. Rejoiced in following the melody of one of them whose brow displayed three eyes and close within the track of this tight knot. He sees two elders differing in their garb but equal in demeanor, grave and firm. One showed himself a close familiar of grave great Hippocrates. Look at 594 to 596, I think is the notes in the back about the elders. And then he sees line 142. I saw four others, one with humble looks, and after these an old man all alone. He came as though sleeping. The seven were clothed of us as with the first brigade, except that as they came around their heads, they wore no garland formed of lilia. These are like the seven that we saw earlier, not the seven virgins, but like the seven lampstands. All right? Only these don't have the, the, the lily of purity on them. Now these have roses, or rather vermilion flowers. The difference between rose and vermilion, or rosé, if you want, and vermilion. So vermilion is a much deeper red. Right. And standing just a short way off, you'd swear that all above their brows bore searing fire. So the chariot stands facing him, and he hears thunder. Canto 30, line 10. <coughs> He hears, cried out from heaven, Vain Isponza de Libano. Come, bride of Lebanon. And the voices speak out, they cry out, Alleluia, Benedictus Quivenus, blessed, what? Are those who come. Manibus odate lilia plainus, blessed art thou that comest, oh, oh, with full hands give lilies. Who's the blessed art thou that comest? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, okay, is what John the Baptist cries out to Christ, or in preparing for Christ, okay? So Dante is still where? He's still on the wrong side, let's say. Of the river Lethe. He's seeing all this on the other side. Line 28. So now, beyond a drifting cloud of flowers, seen through a veil, pure white, olive crown, a lady now appeared to me. Her robe was green, her dress the color of a living flame. And your notes have mentioned several times that green is the color of hope. I don't know why. The notes just assert green is the color of hope. I've never read that anywhere else. I'm pretty sure um, Sayers also mentions that. All right. And I in spirit, who so long had not been, trembling in her presence, rocked by awe, began again to tremble at her glance. Sensing the ancient power of what love was. Line 40. But on the instant that it struck my sight, this power, this virtue, 
love that had pierced me through before I had even left my boyhood state, I turned aside, okay? This power, this virtue, he says, that had what? Pierced me before I'd even left my boyhood state. He's talking about his first experience of seeing Beatrice. The first sight of her, okay? He had this experience, this shot, so to speak, of love. That was kind of seen through a glass darkly compared to what he's about to experience. Because what he's about to experience is going to blow his mind. So he says, I turned aside and leftwards, meaning now, with all the hope and deference of some child that runs when heard or frightened to its mom, to say to Virgil. He turns from her to speak to Virgil. There is not one gram of blood in me that does not tremble now. I recognize the signs signs of ancient flame. Flame is ancient desire. It's not erotic desire. Okay? It's the desire deep inside that needs to be filled. It's the, I don't know what it is I'm looking for. I'm still searching for it, but there is something out there. But Virgil was not there. Our lack alone was left where he'd once been. In other words, just as this image of this woman kind of reawakens this old desire, he turns, and Virgil's no longer there. Our lack alone, that lack is just, there's something missing. Virgil can't fill it, and she, in and of herself, can't fill it. Virgil, dear sire, Virgil, to him I'd run to save my soul. Okay, I'd run. It's probably not I would run. It's I had run. Past tense. When did he run to Virgil? Well, midway through this life's journey, he found himself in a dark wood, and there Virgil shows up and he runs to him. And now the voice speaks. Dante, line 55, that Virgil is no longer here. Do not yet weep. Do not yet weep for that. that. Don't weep because Virgil's gone. A different sword cut first must make you weep. In other words, oh, you're going to weep. You're going to cry. You're going to experience great pain. But it's not because of Virgil being gone. From stern to prow, some admiral will pace to see how well in other holes his captain's fair. Meaning, from the Front of the ship, they have that from stern to prow, from the rear of the ship to the front of the ship. An admiral will pace why? So he can look at his other ships off in the distance and seek to hearten them to do their best. So, epic simile essentially, so almost left along the chariot. Turning round to hear my own name voiced, I hear recorded of necessity, I saw my Donna, who had first appeared hidden in garlands of angelic joy. My Donna, not just a Donna. His beauty, Beatrice. This is what the whole poem, Inferno, Purgatorio, has all been preparing us for. Dante's meeting again with Beatrice. He saw my, uh, I saw my Donna fix from behind, from beyond the brook, her eyes on me. Though still the veil descending from her brows, encircled with Minerva's olifrons, did not allow distinctly any sight of her. He can't see her eyes. He can't see her face. It's veiled. Why? Because he's, well, he kind of is. He's just not fully all the way in. He hasn't crossed over the river Lethe yet. In other words, he is still, in one sense, wracked with sin. Yeah, I know, he's gone all the way up through purgatory. But what didn't happen at the top of purgatory? His memory wasn't cleansed of the ills that he had done. He still bears, carries all that what with him. We use this language today. People bring what with them when they go into a new relationship? Baggage. All that luggage from all those previous relationships. Some people, it's just a little handbag. 
Some people, it's like a whole train of luggage just following you behind. Right? Dante has all of that. And she says, or excuse me, Dante says, her look was stern and proud. Stern implies what? How is she kind of looking at him? With expectation? Smiling? No. If anything, straight-lipped or possibly even slightly frowning at him. With sovereign strength, she then went on, because notice, she's the one who spoke. Okay? She's the one who said, don't be looking for Virgil now. <laughs> Virgil's gone. Okay? As she spoke and spoke as though she still held back until the last her fear, fire, fieriest words. Look. Okay. What's she telling him? Right here. Come on, focus. Right here. Look. I am truly. I am Beatrice. What right had you to venture to this? Who the hell told you? You can come here. Okay, now, notice Dante's reply is kind of, what right had you to venture to this mount? Did you not know that all are happy here? Does Dante seem very happy at this moment? His guide is gone. He's still on this side of the river. Yes, yeah, Statius is still with him. My eyes fell, glancing to the spring clear, spring clear brook. He can't look at her, even though she says, look. But seeing me in that, he sees himself where? In the river Lethe. And what does he see? But seeing me in that, shame bent my brow. His head falls. I dragged my gaze back to the grassy bank. A mother to her son looked stern and proud, so she appeared to me. Her true concern is bitter to the taste and quick to sting. She did not speak, but suddenly as one, the angels sang. The angels sang. The angels sang. In te domine speravi, which is, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Notice what he's not putting his trust in. One, Virgil, who's gone, what else is he putting his trust in? Himself. Why? Because he looked in the river, and what did he see? Himself. What did he do? His shame bowed him down. The river, okay, when he, when he goes up onto that first platform in purgatory, remember, I talked about Sarah's Dunk where she says, you know, that's confession, confession, contrition, penance, etc. And he has to go all the way up. Yeah, that's the external part of it. That's the rite, the ritual. It's when he looks in the river, however, he really sees inside. Right? And then he gives us another simile. And says, the second half of the simile, So too, until those beings sang, that is, until he heard, In thee, O Lord, do I trust. Until those beings sang, their notes are all concordant with the heavenly spheres, that is, they're in harmony with the music of the spheres. I'd been there uttering no sigh or tear. And yet on hearing through these harmonies their pity on me, it seemed they had said, why don't I cause him discord such as this? Notice, it seemed that they had said. In my ears, I heard when they were singing, come on, Beatrice, cut him some slack. The ice so tightly stretched around my core turned now to breath and water, issuing at mouth and eye in spasms from my heart. What's he doing? Weeping. The gift of tears, the Old Testament called it. Breaking down. 
just torrents of sighs, breath, okay, and tears. She still left her on the chariot. She's still standing on the chariot on the other side of the river. She says to him, you wake in vigil through eternal day. So neither night nor sleep can steal from you a single step that time takes, traveling by. Thus, answering, my greater care must be, okay, that is, in answering what? What he thought, what appeared to him what the voice is saying, which again was, why donut lady, why cause him such discord as this? Uh, thus answering, my greatest care must be that he in tears there grasps what I intend and brings to balance all his grief and guilt. Brings to, owns up to it, accepts it all, sees it all. Not only by the work of heaven's great wheels, excuse me, that sin with its companion stars, each seed along the road towards its rightful end, but also by those holy generosities that reign in grace from clouded power so high that human sight can come in no way near. Okay? He's got to understand how does he achieve salvation. It's not through his own works. It's ultimately grace. This man, through all his new life, and Dante wrote a book called La Vita Nuova, The New Life. And new is a word he uses throughout in this idea of a new life. He uses throughout his writings. This man, through all his new life, fresh and young, in virtual power, was one, notice the tense, was one who might have proved in all of his behavior wonderful. What's she implying? David Cassidy died the other day. Anybody know, did you read what his last words were? His daughter reported it on Twitter. So much wasted time. Dying words. So much wasted time. That's kind of what Beatrice is saying to Dante here. She's saying, you could have X, Y, Z. Right? Yet, there, on earth, the richer soil may be, the more, that is, the richer the soil may be, the more untilled or sown with evil seed, its vigor turns to wilderness and bane. She's talking about Dante back in life. Don and she says, I, looking on, sustained him for a time. While I was alive, and he focused on me, she says, I sustained him. That is, I kept him what? Kind of above the wilderness, above the bane, above the common. Okay. My eyes, when bright with youth, I turned to him and led him with me on the road to truth. Then, on the threshold of my second age, in the convivio, Dante divides the natural life of men into four ages. One, adolescence, which is from birth to 25. Birth to 25. That's the first age, according to Dante in the Convivio. The second age is, quote unquote, manhood, from 25 to 45. Adulthood, let's say. Let's not be sexist. The third age, from 45 to 70. Okay. Notice, Dante's writing this in the late 1200s. And yet we have this popular conception. Ah, everybody in the Middle Ages died when they were 30. He wouldn't divide life into these ages if 30 was the common death of adulthood or adults. The last age, decrepitude. I'm glad you bumped that up a few years. From 70 to 80 and over. Okay? Beatrice died at the age of 25. In other words, just before moving into adulthood from adolescence, according to Dante's four ages. Okay? So she says, back to where I was, then 
on the threshold of my second age, I changed, took different life. Think, you know, chrysalis butterfly. She metamorphosed. How so? She became what she is now. Yeah, it is. I know. Well, I just clicked them on them. So I guess we don't need to start dancing around and stuff. Um, I changed, took different life. That is, she died, went on, became what she was intended to be. And he at once drew back and yielded to another's glance. That is, once, once she left Dante's gaze, what did he do? something else to gaze at. And that's specifically what she's getting at. He drew his eyes from me, because she had left, to another pretty face. But she doesn't mean Dante looked at her as a pretty face. Dante, in all of his writings, I mean, he implies for him, Beatrice was a God-bearer. It wasn't erotic love he had for her. It was divine caritas. Okay? So, she goes on. Risen from body into spirit form, my goodness, power, and beauty grew more strong. That is, stronger than they were in my body. Yet I to him was then less dear, less pleasing. Well, why? I couldn't see her. All right? Poets deal with this idea all the time. There's reason why we have the phrase out of sight, out of mind. He turned his steps to paths that were not true. He followed images of failing good. Okay. She was an image of successful good, positive good. So he turned from her to images of failing good, which cannot meet in full their promises. For example, Jerry Maguire. What's the famous line? Uh, what's your name? Says to Tom Cruise towards the end. You complete me. Wrong. Wrong. Beatrice would say, from the pit of hell wrong. Beatrice would say, if you think you're going to find your happiness in another person, you are woefully doing that. Because what will that other person sometimes do? If you think you're going to find your happiness in another person, what are you turning that other person into? Every idol does what? Let's us down. It falls off its perch. Sometimes it jumps off its perch. Okay? Two words. Harvey Weinstein. Why? Because these images of failing good cannot meet in full their promises. They might say the right thing, but they can't perform it. And when I prayed that he might be inspired, seeking to call him back by dreams and other ways, all that came to nothing. Notice what Dante's, Dante's psychology here is just beautiful. Because this is Dante writing this, right? So he's putting words in Beatrice's mouth, but the words that he's putting in Beatrice's mouth are about himself. So when she says, seeking to call him back by dreams and other ways, all that came to nothing. What is Dante, if we take this both literally and or allegorically, and Dante says, you gotta understand it literally first or you'll never get the allegory. Taking that literally, what is he telling us? That he, Dante, had dreams of Beatrice. And what? He didn't follow. 
or visions of you. He didn't pay them any heed. He didn't listen to her. And he's telling us, his readers, that. How? By putting that knowledge in Beatrice's mouth. Beatrice is a blessed spirit. She doesn't lie. Dante, so far, is not a blessed spirit. He might fudge the truth a little bit. Right? But she doesn't. She says, all that, all my little hints came to nothing. He paid little heed. He fell so far that every other means to save this man by now came short, unless he saw himself those people who are lost. In other words, what does it take to get Dante on the right path? Send him to hell. Notice what Dante is telling us is the theme of the book, ultimately. It's salvation. It's how to attain salvation. And he seems to be saying, I'm one of those really dense, thick skulled ones. I gotta really see the other alternative before I go, mm, I don't really want that. I went then to the doorway of the dead. Where was that? Limbo, <coughs> she says, and weeping my entreaties. There were born to one who since has brought him to these heights. She was weeping for Dante when she went to Limbo to speak to Virgil. God's high degree decree would shatter, though, if he should pass by the Lethe and go on to taste the food of life. What? Yet leave unpaid the tax of penitent, penitence, which flows out, pours out flowing tears. God's decree would shatter. What's the decree? You don't enter the realm of the blessed until you do what? What's Lethe symbolic of? Louder? How? Okay. How? Baptism. It's baptism. How do we know it's baptism? Because he doesn't just walk right across the river. He does what? Matilda takes him by the hand, and then Beatrice also, and he goes all the way under. He's not Presbyterian, a little bit of sprinkle between. Okay? This is good Catholic, you know, all the way under. In fact, he goes so far all the way under, what does he do? He drinks the water of Lethe. So it's kind of like, well, he's not only clean on the outside, he's getting cleansed on the inside too. So that's why she says he's got to do that. You, 31. You who are there beyond the sacred stream, she begins. Fess up. Say, say, if this is true. To such a charge, your own confession needs to be conjoined. Notice, to such a charge, I charge you with having ignored me. And having ignored all my premonitions to you after my death, when I came to you in visions and such, true or false? Okay, what's she really asking Dante to do? Dante, you gonna say I'm a liar? And she sits here and glows. <laughs> Light pours out of her, not like there's a big omega spotlight shining off of her. It's pour, for, pouring forth through her. Why? Because of her connection to God. And what happens? My natural powers by now were now so confused, he says, my voice began to move, and yet no sound came out. And for a while, he just stands there, he, and he can't say anything. And she's like, come on, speak up, respond. Fear and confusion intermixed in me, drove from my lips, so hard to hear, it needed sight to make it. Notice, he doesn't have to give a big, long speech. This isn't the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. You know, where the Pharisee goes into the church, Oh God, I am so thankful I'm a Pharisee and I follow all the law, and I'm not like that filthy publican. What's the publican do? Falls down on his face and says, God, forgive me a sinner. Does a 
say anything about anybody else. He just says, I know my state. I burst in that same way, line 19, beneath the load and shedding streams of sighs and sobs and tears. My voice came slack and slow along its course. He's just letting it all out now. And she says, in your desire for me, which then was leading you to love the good. Okay. Where have we heard that love the good before? Not enough. From the mouth of Socrates, okay? when he's talking about the good as being the ultimate light, the highest good, the summum bonum, right? Which was then leading you to love the good beyond which we cannot aspire to reach. The good beyond which we cannot aspire to reach. That's the highest good, God. What ditches or what change across your path did you discover that led you to strip the hopes you had of getting further on? What easements, profits, gains, or benefits? Notice, she's asking him these questions to do what? To dig into his soul. Oh, there's a little bit of darkness over there, Dante. Here, let's rip it up and open it up to the light. Let's shine the light wide so all the darkness can be gotten out. She's acting like a surgeon. What easements, profits, gain, or benefit displayed themselves to you on other brows, that is, faces, that you preferred to flounce within their sight? I drew the bitterest of sighs. <laughs> Still can't respond. Weeping, I said, line 34, Mere things of here and now and their false pleasures. Not here and now, here at the very top of Mount Purgatory, just before he's going to take his step into heaven. He means here and now, outside Florence. Mere things of here and now and their false pleasures turned my steps away the moment that your face had hid itself. The moment you die. He says, my soul turned to what? Temporary pleasures. And she says, and had you been silent, that is, if you hadn't admitted this, if you hadn't just now confessed this or denied what you confess, your guilt would equally have been observed. It's known to such a judge. But when the plea of guilty in this court burst freely uttered from the sinner's cheek, the grindstone here will turn against the blade. In other words, you need not fear execution. Meaning, the other place. Why? You openly admitted everything. So she says, Listen and hear how down a different path my flesh when buried should have made you move. She's not done. She's got to get him perfectly cleansed. Never had art or nature shown to you such beauty and delight as did those lamps in which I was enclosed, now strewn in earth. She's not saying I was the swimsuit model of the 13th century. She is saying my bodily form was designed for what? To bring you grace. Not physical, not sexual. And if that great delight, because I died, did fail for you, what other dying thing should have drawn you to desire of it? She's saying, if, if my dying failed you, then how could some other dying thing have brought you joy? Pierced by the arrows of fallacious things, you should at once have raised yourself on high to follow me. You should have inquired after, where'd Beatrice go? Okay. To follow me, I being none such now. None such, that is, I being nothing down here below. All of your thoughts, all of your mentality should have been aimed above. You ought not to have weighed your feathers down just waiting to be stricken by some girl. 
or other novelty of short-lived use. There's a note there, which if I remember right, was kind of interesting. The Pargoletta, translated as girl, may be associated with the stony lady of Dante's Reem Petros. Beatrice has now assumed some of the characteristics of this daunting and resistant figure. Of the Pargoletta, Dante writes, Who will look into this lovely girl's eyes that have so affected me that all I can do is await death, which is so harsh to me? Okay. She says, um, Line 67. Since you grieve at what you're hearing, raise your beard and looking up, you'll feel still greater pain. Is he still, he's looking down, he can't even look at her as she says all this. Raise your beard means what? Stand up. She's essentially telling him, take it like a man. Why? Because you're about to feel greater pain. In other words, you've experienced pain. And this confession has been painful for him. But now you're about to experience even more pain. And so he does as he is told. And as I stretched my face, line 76, as I stretched to show my face to her, those primal creatures, as my eyes observed, had ceased in scattering their arc of flowers. The, those lights of mine, still very far from sure, his eyes, sorry. You know how the medieval people thought eyes worked? Anybody know this? Your eyes shot out beams of light. And the beams of light illumined things. Okay? Which was why it was thought in the Middle Ages, a man and a woman, unless they're married, should not gaze into each other's eyes. Because those beams of light can entangle. Eye sex. Essentially. Eye intercourse. Okay? John Donne not a medieval, but he adopts medieval imagery and such, talks about looking into a lover's eyes and propagating cells. Beautiful image when you think about it. Because when you look in your beloved's eyes, what do you see? Yourself. So you make yourself in their eyes, or his or her eyes, and he or she does the same in you. So what's it all about? It's all about beginning myself in you in this kind of weird twisted way so he says those uh, those lights of mine still very far from sure saw Beatrice run excuse me turn towards the beast being two natures and in person one so he just explains there about the griffin two natures one person divine human Christ right and beneath her veil, beyond the flowing stream, she overcame, it seemed, what once she'd been, when once as here she overcame all women. The nettle of remorse now stung so sharp, it gnawed my heart. He says, overwhelmed, I fell. What I became, she knows who is the cause. When my heart gave, uh, when my heart gave back my outward powers, the donor whom I'd found there all alone, <coughs> saw above me, saying, grip me, grip, she'd drawn me up to throat height in the stream. So now he's in the water, up to his throat. Pulling me behind her, went her way across the wave as light as any skiff. And then when I approached the blessed shore, asparagus me was heard. So sweetly sung, I can't remember it, still less than right. Asparagus me. Psalm 51.7. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. She opens her arms wide, she circles his head, and what? Pushes him down. Submerging me so far, I could not help but swallow from the stream. And then she takes him out to the four lovely ones. Right? Line 115, they bring him to the griffin's breast, where Beatrice stands. And they say, make sure you do not spare your eyes. We placed you here before these emeralds from which love aimed his arrows at you once. A thousand longings, fiercer than, fiercer far than flame, wrestled my eyes to her, shining black, fixed on the griffin, never wavering. Okay? He's looking at her eyes. Her eyes are looking at what? This. Notice what is happening. 
she is drawing him to this. Right? Reader, line 124. Just think how great my wonder was to see that creature stilled within itself and yet within that icon altering. He tells us, translation does at least, it's an icon. An icon is never meant An icon is never meant to direct attention solely to the piece of wood upon it which it's written. It always direct, directs one's attention to the image of the thing that is depicted. So if it's an icon of Christ, it's not in the Orthodox or some Catholic tradition. It's not venerated for being a painting on a piece of wood. It's venerated because it's an image of the thing that brings its, its import. So, he goes on, And while astounded yet so full of joy, my soul received the savor of a food that feeds us full and makes us thirst for more. My soul received the savor of the food that feeds us full and makes us thirst for more. Well, what's that food? It's Christ. Take, eat. Take, drink. Psalms say, one of the Psalms says, well, come, taste and see, the Lord is good. Right? So Beatrice says, turn your holy eyes. Notice, his eyes are no longer impure. Who for your sight has moved so many steps. In grace we beg, do us the grace to lift the veil that veils your lips so he can tell the second beauty that you still conceive of. Right? Then we come to Canto 32, which I'm going to give a very short version of. Let's see here. What happens in Canto 32? Dante sees the tree of knowledge. Okay, How does the tree of knowledge appear in this canto? Okay, notice they're still on earth, so to speak. This is still the Garden of Eden, paradise. The tree of knowledge has not been transplanted from someplace else to here. This is the knowledge, this is the tree that Adam and Eve ate from. Only problem with the tree now is it's what? Dead. No life. No greenery. Nothing. This is like the tree in Waiting for Godot. Dead, shriveled, hull, essentially. Okay? So what happens? The chariot tree, this thing, okay, excuse me, is drawn to the tree of knowledge and touches it. And what happens to the tree of knowledge? It bursts into leaves. Why? Because this tree, the cross, according to medieval tradition, medieval Catholic tradition, and there is some of this in the, in the Eastern Church Fathers, the tree of the wood of the cross came from the tree of knowledge. So, just as, to paraphrase St. Paul, just as through one tree sin came into the world, so through one tree Sin was overcome. Okay. Just as through one tree death came into the world, so through one tree life was renewed. Because it's only through the cross, according to Christian theology, that one finds real, true life. That's what Christ said, you know, if you're going to follow me, what do you have to do? Take up your cross. Okay? So, the tree is revived by Christ, okay? And what happens? Dante falls asleep. It's like this is too much, okay? Go on to 33. I'm skipping an awful lot just because we've got 13 minutes left and we haven't even started parables. Um, Thirty-three. Beatrice essentially explains what Dante has seen in these pageants, right? 
we're going to actually um, skip most of it because a lot of what she's doing here, I'm essentially on page 315, is she's talking about different periods of church history. Okay? But notice Dante at this point, he doesn't remember his faults. He doesn't know what Lethe was yet. It's going to be explained to him. But he doesn't, he's not burdened anymore by those sins. So we hear line 127. And then we back up, 124. Um, Beatrice says, Maybe greater cares, which often take the memory away, have made his mind grow darker in its view. Talking about Lethe, which he's just referred to earlier. And that's where Matilda is named, line 119, right? But see, you know, you know, it's beautiful what? Knowledge. Okay. But see, you know, this is the second river or stream, which is flowing there. Lead him to that. And as you always do, bring back his fainting, half-dead powers to life. As noble souls inclined to do, they make another's will without excuse, their will as soon as any sign of that appears. So too, Dante now says, when I was taken by the hand, the lovely lady made her way and said, to Statius, as Adona does, come to, that is, as a lady does, talking about manners, she invites Statius also. Okay? To where? To walk through the river, you know. So they've gone through Lethe. All the sins that they've remembered are washed clean. Dante no longer remembers having done anything wrong. In Paradise, Paradiso, Dante's going to say, well, I don't, and Beatrice is going to kind of smirk at him. She's going to say, it's just because you don't remember having done it. Okay? So they go through there, and now they're going to go through the river of beautiful knowledge. If, reader, I had more space in which to write, then I should sing in part about that drink, so sweet I never have my fill of it. However, since these pages now are full, prepared by rights to take the second song, the reins of art won't let me pass me long. Beyond. I come back from that holiest of waves, remade, refreshed, as any new tree is, like the tree of knowledge. Renewed, refreshed with foliage, anew, pure and prepared to rise toward the start. In other words, after this second drink, Dante is essentially what Dante was always meant to be. He's telling us this is what humanity is designed for. The kind of bliss he's now going to start describing in the next canto or the next <coughs> book. Okay. And, and by the way, if you hadn't already... Um, I haven't mentioned it, but if you hadn't already put it together, Cantica Canto, song, singing, chanting. Okay? These are each kind of chants, and each canto within each cantica is like a smaller verse of a larger song. Okay? So, glory from him who moves all things that are, penetrates the universe and then shines back, reflected more in one part, less elsewhere. What does he mean, reflected more in one part, less elsewhere? Does that mean God's glory is reflected more in Ashley and, and not as much in you guys? No. What it means is when the focus is on Ashley, the glory is all there. When the focus moves to Madison, then it's all there. When it moves to Andrew, it's all there, okay? So, he goes on, and he starts rising through, through the spheres. So we have Earth. What's the next sphere? Moon. The next sphere, Mercury, right? The Sun, or Mercury, Venus, the Sun, or Moon, Venus, Mercury. I can't remember the exact order. But he's going to start going through all these spheres. And we say, when we say he goes through the sphere of the moon, 
He literally goes through the moon. Not just the ball that the moon, you know, kind of circles in. So, I'm going to skip a lot of the first canto. Line 91. Dante's trying to figure out, how can I be rising? I mean, he feels himself, I'm flesh and blood. What is the nature of flesh and blood? That is. Why? Because flesh and blood are matter, and it's Aristotelian thought that matter is drawn toward the center of the earth. We understand that principle that it's spread. It's not necessarily just the center of the earth, because if that matter gets closer to the sun, it gets drawn towards the center of the sun, etc. So Dante is just applying a little, you know, scientific uh, common sense. How, how is it I can rise? And she tells him, one, line 91, you are not still on earth as you suppose. No thunderbolt that flees its proper place ran at such speed as you return to yours. As you return to yours. Yours what? Your proper place. <coughs> what is Dante's proper place? In the presence of God. She is saying, Dante, you are moving faster to your proper place, your desired end, okay, than lightning flashes. Why? Because he's made in the image and likeness of God. He is intended to be with God for all eternity. Dante's like, okay, cool. I, I rest content in utmost wonder, he says. Line 106. Um... Yeah. Uh, she explains the order, well, she kind of explains the order and structure of the universe. The highest creatures see the footprints there of God's eternal prowess and his work, the end to which, as mentioned here, the rule is made. That is, the rule, the order, the structure is made. Within the order I'm speaking of, all things, according to their kind, will veer towards their origin, some near, some far. That is, Earth will draw to earth. Fire does what? It rises. Okay. Water does what? It seeks a level. So, if water starts up here, and it runs down here, and this is level, it runs down and becomes level. Therefore, across the ocean of to be, that is existence, all natures move towards their different ports each move by import of a given drive. That import of a given drive, that's the thing I mentioned way back a long time ago. The genius or the daemon or sometimes it's just a D-A-E, D-O-N, of each thing. That is its inborn purpose. What it is meant to do or be, like that bug flying around, meant to you know, rise up. Okay, But each thing has this inborn purpose. And she says, the providence, line 121, now skip three lines, two lines, the providence bears us now to our appointed place. God created in such a way, Dante, that you and I are now heading to where, to where we are supposed to be. That bowstring with its power to aim aright, whatever it lets fly to happy targets. So she says it's true. What? What's true? Sometimes form will fail to be attuned to what the art intends, since matter being deaf will not respond. That is, this iPhone doesn't have any choice whether to fall or not. Right? But things with wills are different. A creature which can freely bend will sometimes, though impelled entirely straight, desert that course and wander off elsewhere. Well, we can go back about, oh, I don't know, five cantos? Six cantos, maybe? And see what? No, actually, four cantos. Well, what happened when Beatrice died? Dante 
who was impelled entirely straight. Following Beatrice, she died, and what happened? Who oh, upon? That's what happened. Okay. He was diverted and wandered off elsewhere. So, as lightning flashes from thunder clouds, that first impetus strikes down, wrenched wrong by false delight, towards earth. The blonde, the brunette, the redhead, so to speak. All right? Canto 2, line 19. I know we've only got a couple minutes, so... Inborn in being, that is, native to being, our perpetual thirst to reach the deformed domain now bore us on as rapid almost as the spheres you see. The deformed, God formed. It means both God formed domain and the domain of God. Okay? Why? Because Dante is saying, and he's kind of parroting St. Augustine, right? Everyone is born with a God-sized hole in their soul. And the hole can only be filled by God. Too many people, imagine the hole is round, too many people try to fill it with a square peg. It doesn't work. Or they try to fill it with a whole mess of other things. Buying stuff, snorting stuff, shooting stuff, dropping stuff, drinking stuff, sleeping with stuff, whatever. All the, you know, analgesics of pain of our society. Okay? Rather than the deform domain. Beatrice looked up and I looked at her. Notice he's still doing what? He's still following Beatrice. Just because he's in heaven doesn't mean he's now looking around Beatrice or beyond. He's still following her. We're going, maybe, we'll get to this point. At the end, Dante is going, going to get to the point where it's just kind of like a, I'm going with Beatrice. He gets to the celestial vision and sees God in God's glory. He doesn't need Beatrice anymore at that point. Okay, it's 11.05, so we'll stop. So we'll pick up with, yeah, we'll pick up with just a couple more comments about Canto 2 and then try to zip on along.